Awesome. Okay. I think we're good to start. Um, I am super excited to have everyone join our workshop today. I'm going to go ahead and briefly introduce our speaker. Our speaker's name is Dana Abbey. She's an associate professor with the Strauss Health Sciences Library on here on the Anschutz campus and an engagement coordinator with the network of the National Library of Medicine. Thank you so much for presenting to our group today. We're very excited uh, for the presentation. Thanks, Karen. I appreciate that. Let me get started here. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining in today so we can discuss the role of plain language in research. And um, as Karen mentioned, I'm a medical librarian at the Strauss Health Sciences Library, and I'm funded by the National Library of Medicine to improve access to health information across a nine state region. As you know, clinical research can be complex and research related terms can be challenging to understand. And this can make it difficult for healthcare providers, researchers and their teams to communicate effectively with patients, potential study participants and uh, their caregivers. Even individuals with advanced education may struggle to comprehend scientific concepts such as research interventions, procedures, and instructions. And this can hinder their ability to make informed decisions about participating in your research studies. Plain language is a powerful tool that can help bridge this gap. By using clear, concise language, we can ensure that information is accessible to everyone regardless of their educational background. And this can lead to informed consent, increased public trust, and broader participation in research. Dana, all right. if you're supposed yeah. to be advancing your slides, we can't see them. Oh. It's still the title slide. Yeah, that's it, yeah. Okay. Um, today we'll explore key principles for effective communication, introduce tools for reviewing research materials, and provide examples of plain language in action. And as Karen mentioned, please use the chat for any questions or comments. And let's start off with a poll. So Sierra, if you could do poll number one, true or false, plain language is only important for informed consent documents. All right, so the answer is false. And as we go along, um, you will be able to see how um, that's true. And just so you know, I have no financial interests or affiliations with any of the companies, products, or services that I'll be covering in this presentation today. All the recommendations and opinions are um, based solely on my professional judgment and research of these services. Complex language can be found in many areas of our lives, from legal documents to scientific articles. For instance, let's take a look at a passage from Apple's iPhone legal agreement. Do you find it easy to understand? Cognitive researchers at MIT have studied why legal documents often seem so confusing. They've discovered that lawyers have a tendency to interrupt sentences with lengthy definitions. And this complex sentence structure is known as center embedding, and it can make text significantly harder to comprehend. Here's a plain language translation of that same passage from a resource from the American Bar Association called the Legalese Decoder. This version is much easier to comprehend. The decoder uses artificial intelligence, natural language processing, and machine learning to analyze legal documents 
and rephrase the content into plain language. And if we have time, I'll show you that you can also use it for a variety of um, content, not just legal content. But perhaps even better is a graphic that simplifies the main concepts of the apps for licensing. The human brain can process images faster than text, making infographics a really effective way to communicate complex data and information. And uh, the human brain can process entire images seen for as little as 13 milliseconds. This particular infographic was generated with Claude AI. I used the prompt, can you create an infographic based on the following text and added the licensing information. Claude AI did a good job of synthesizing the complex data and gathering insights from the text, though there are some gaps. Um, there's no mention of what the acronym EULA stands for, um, and there might be some other information that uh, you would need to clarify if you're putting this in front of a patient. You can use resources like Claude AI to summarize text, um, CSV files, PDFs, and document files. And you can also ask for edits to the generated images so you could add any necessary content or clarify content that you don't think Claude did a very good job with. But as a reminder, at the end of the day, it is an artificial intelligence tool and may sometimes provide inaccurate results. So be sure to review the uh, generated information and make sure that it is conveying what you want it to. Here's another real world example, a health insurance policy. This is a passage from my CU health insurance related to emergency services. And the text is very dense and has numerous terms that I may not be able to understand. Um, or maybe I'm trying to read this while I'm at the emergency room. Ultimately, I'm not really sure what I need to take away from this information. Here's a plain language translation of that same passage from the Legalese Decoder from the American Bar Association. So I think I understand now that I won't have to pay more than I would in my in-network my in charges to get emergency care, but that there might be additional fees. So I just better get out my credit card, I think. And here's an example of how Claude AI interpreted the text to generate this infographic. Again, I used a prompt, can you create an infographic based on the following text and added the emergency billing statement. So I think it did a pretty okay job of extracting the key points out of that really dense uh, paragraph that we were initially presented with. And again, you can ask that uh, changes be made or if there's something that you want to add to the content. So patients and community members often find themselves navigating a complex maze of legal documents like this and medical documents. And uh, they can be filled with jargon and technical terms that are difficult to understand. So when medical information is being communicated, assessing the readability of the written health information is a common way to evaluate whether uh, patients or study participants are likely to understand it. Research has consistently shown that patients struggle to retain medical information that they receive. Uh, multiple studies indicate that only about 50% of medical information is retained in both inpatient and outpatient settings. And this retention rate can drop even lower if the patient is stressed or overwhelmed and the complexity of the medical terminology being used can further complicate the understanding. And then added to that, if your uh, study participant or patient is elderly or has limited health literacy, they face additional challenges on top of all the other challenges we spoke of. Unfortunately, there is not a single resource like the Legalese Decoder for decoding medical or scientific information to make it plain language. But there are many other tools available, more coming out every day, and we'll take a look at some of those today. Um, I wanna mention that all the resources we'll look at today have a free limited use version. 
Um, some of them are completely free always. Um, and let's go to poll number two. Yes or no, I use infographics to convey complex information to patients and or to study participants. Great, thank you all for answering that. Um, I think that's amazing that 61% of you are already using that. And maybe those of you who aren't after today will try some of these tools that have been presented to see if, um, if it works for your setting. All right. What is plain language? Plain language, according to the plainlanguage.gov, is communication that's clear and easy to grasp the first time somebody reads it or hears it. And this is really crucial um, in research where you're trying to convey complex medical and scientific concepts. Plain language um, is a communication technique. And I mentioned earlier about health literacy. And health literacy is the ability to understand information and take action on it. So plain language highly contributes to improving an individual's health literacy. So the average American reads between sixth and eighth grade, a sixth and eighth grade level, um, while an estimated 20% can only read at about a fourth grade level. The suggested reading level for plain language material is at least below eighth grade. And depending on the groups that you're working with, you may need to go um, lower, like sixth grade or fifth grade. However, uh, there is a gap that gets created between the average uh, reading level of the general public and the average reading level for scientific or medical information. The average reading level when you go to a scientific setting or medical setting is grade 16. So double what um, the minimum would be. So this creates a significant gap between the information researchers need to convey and the understanding of their intended audience. So what this means is that many part, uh, potential study participants might find the research materials confusing, making it difficult uh, to make an informed decision about participating, or they might drop out of the study once they've started. Clear communication can help build public trust in your research. Uh, by using plain language principles, which we'll cover, researchers can bridge the gap and um, make, these, all these tools will help you make your uh, printed materials, your scripts, um, telephone, messages, whatever you're um, putting out there, more accessible and user-friendly, even to people without a scientific background. So I, it would be great if after today you could walk away and be um, an A-plus student in this area, but it really is an art to um, effectively communicate in plain language. And it may take some time for you and your team to feel comfortable doing it, but there are some key principles. So uh, the first one is to know your audience. It's really critical to understand the level of education and background knowledge of the people you're trying to communicate with and to tailor your language and style to their specific needs. The second key point is to use simple language Try to avoid jargon, technical terms, and complex sentence structures, and use everyday words and phrases that are easy to understand. And third, be concise and clear. Try to get to the point quickly and avoid unnecessary words and phrases. Um, and it's really helpful to use analogies and metaphors to explain uh, complex concepts. For example, um, when talking about glaucoma, an analogy of a balloon could be used to explain how the increased eye pressure damages vision. 
Uh, the fourth point, use active voice. An active voice is more direct and easier to understand than passive voice. For example, you could say the nurse will administer the medication. That's active voice. While a passive voice would be the medication will be administered by the nurse. And as we looked at some visuals, visuals can really help clarify information and make it more engaging. Um, use charts, graphs, and other visuals to break up text and to make your content more visually appealing. And lastly, try to test your content. Have someone else read your content and give you feedback, and then ask them to explain the content in their own words. It looks like we actually have a question in the okay. chat. We'll pause here really quick. Um, Barbara asks, is there a difference in understanding if patients or participants uh, read it or hear it? Well, I think it depends on the setting that they are receiving it. If you're talking to them um, via their cell phone or something um, and you have a telephone script, um, it kind of hits both of those, right? Like you need to have it written in a certain way so when they hear the spoken word, that they will understand it. But if you're giving them written instructions, like uh, please let us know if you experience any of the following side effects or something, um, then that would be strictly in the written word. So it depends on how the, the message is being conveyed. Um, if you're speaking to them uh, directly or if you're just giving them um, information via email or you're handing them a form that you need them to sign off on or something like that. Um, I hope that answers your question. But basically you would follow the same uh, rules for simplifying the content, whether it's a spoken word or a written word. All right. So to improve patient understanding and engagement, we need to simplify complex medical information. So I've got some examples for you. Um, and we can take a look at the technical language being used and then how we can simplify it to plain language. So instead of saying um, the clinical trial protocol requires daily oral administration of the medication, we can simplify that and say, you'll need to take one pill every day. Here's another example. Instead of saying adverse dermatological reactions may occur at the application site, you can simply just state your skin might get red or itchy where you put the cream. And one last example, the study requires monitoring of nocturnal sleep patterns via polysomnography could be greatly simplified by saying, while you sleep at night, we'll use special tools to see how well you're sleeping. Clinical trials often face significant recruitment and retention challenges. Up to 85% of trials struggle to enroll enough participants, and up to 80% are delayed to recruitment problems. Fewer than 4% of U.S. adults participate in clinical trials, and minority populations are particularly underrepresented. Hispanics and Latinos uh, represent only about 11% of trial participants, and individuals identifying as non-Hispanic Black or African Americans account for just about 5% of clinical trial participants. And additionally, patient dropout rates range from about 15 to 40%, further impacting trial outcomes. And um, ultimately, it might cost you more or the trial might not happen at all. There are many reasons participants drop out of studies, but let's make sure your communication tools aren't the reason. Plain language can help researchers mitigate participant dropout rates by ensuring participants clearly understand the research, its implications, and their role, thereby increasing engagement and reducing confusion that might lead to their withdrawal of the study. So um, tailor communications based on the individual's needs. 
clearly outline the study process, the time commitment, the potential challenges. Um, these will all help participants manage um, their expectations and feel prepared and use culturally appropriate language and imagery uh, to help build trust among the communities that you want to work with. And again, present the information in plain language um, and create a supportive environment where participants feel comfortable asking questions and make sure they understand where to, to go to get those questions answered. And then uh, make sure you have clear and concise instructions for study visits and um, provide regular updates in plain language to help participants stay engaged. And uh, one of the biggest reasons people leave a study is um, the side effects of either the medication that they're taking or um, the protocol that they're supposed to follow. But ex by explaining potential side effects in a really straightforward, plain language manner allows participants to manage their expectations um, and understand that um, there might be some adverse effects and, and then who to contact if they do have those. And we'll look at some resources today that will help you um, write that communication information in a plain language format. All right, so um, if we have clear communication, we have better recruitment. Uh, the research team can streamline the process of identifying eligible participants with clear, concise screening questions and researchers can empower potential participants to make informed decisions uh, with plain language informed consent forms. And we'll take a look at one of those in a little bit. The research team um, can utilize the telephone scripts, the text messages, and any social media campaigns that are tied to your research um, to reach a wide, diverse audience. And researchers can enhance public understanding and engagement by providing study summaries and research findings in easy to understand language. And this also um, helps researchers influence decision and policymakers by um, promoting the adoption of evidence-based practice with plain language policy briefs. And beyond language barriers, cultural nuance plays a really significant role in effective communications. UCLA did a study a couple of years ago um, that revealed that a substantial number of patients with primary languages other than English signed consent documents in languages that they didn't fully understand. And to mitigate this risk, it's really crucial to employ certified medical or scientific translators who are not only looking at the content, the words that you're trying to translate, but also making sure that they're capturing the cultural context. And an example of that would be um, the Cambodian term Krun, K-R-U-N. So it's commonly translated as fever, but it can also encompass a broader meeting, um, just like generally not feeling well or also feeling hot and cold. So if um, your study participants need to report if they have a fever, you need to be really clear um, what, you're, what you're asking them to do, that you want them to um, report any fevers using a, 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 some type of temperature gauge above whatever threshold that you wanna have, like 100 or something. Um, so I think it's great uh, practice to bring those translators in while you're developing tools. Um, not just at the end, although you might not realize that you need the translation till the end, but I think it's really great to bring in people who are trained uh, medical and scientific translators to help you with that. So hyperkalemia is a medical condition where potassium levels in the blood are too high. And to help us better understand and communicate information about hyperkalemia, We'll use this real world example to demonstrate how to simplify complex text. This abstract is from a research article and it's intended uh, for the scientific community. 
So we'll explore several online tools that help make complex information more accessible. Um, so how can we make this information like a scientific article easier for people to understand? So we've talked about one measuring readability level. Uh, these uh, tools are called readability formulas. And these formulas look at things like sentence length and word complexity to kind of estimate how easy or hard your content is for somebody to read. But they aren't perfect. Um, they can give us a general idea, but they don't generally tell us the whole story. So there are a, um, several dozen readability formulas. There are three that are commonly used in medicine or science. Um, the Flesh Reading Ease formula, the Flesh Kincaid grade level formula, and the SMOG index. And SMOG is an acronym for Simple Measures of Gobbledygook. Uh, so some tips for making your uh, writing more clear. Again, use simple language. Um, if that's the one thing you take away from this presentation today, try to avoid jargon, anything that you would uh, use amongst your colleagues. Um, think about explaining something to your neighbor who um, is not in health or medicine and how you might convey what you're doing in your study to, to them. Keep the sentences short. Oops, sorry. Um, and break up really long paragraphs if you can. You can use bullet points, you can use headers, um, different ways of breaking up the text visually. And again, uh, use pictures and charts or diagrams to help explain some complex ideas. And so one big game changer uh, to the world of plain language has really been artificial intelligence. Whether we love it or hate it, um, it has really been a game changer for creating a lot, almost all the products that we're gonna look at today. Um, they all use artificial intelligence in some way to um, read your content, make suggestions of your content or completely rewrite your content or to take your content and turn it into um, a graphic. And um, it can identify gr uh, complex language and suggest simpler alternatives. Um, and there are two camps that this information generally falls into. So there are readability checkers so ones that just analyze text and suggest ways to prove it. And then there are readability converters that in addition to analyzing the content, they will actually rewrite the content for you. And we'll look at some of both of those camps. We actually have a few yeah. questions. Maybe we could take a quick pause right here. Um, Maggie asks, do you find pushback from practices and institutions arguing that this will take too much time or that they don't have the personnel to take the time to simplify written medical language. I'm wondering how difficult it has been to make simplifying medical language systemic, that is expected, carried through, and um, commonplace. Those are all uh, great comments. And I think in general, depending on the setting, like most hospital and clinic settings, um, this is just a part of what they do, trying to make the content written at a level that the patients will understand. So it's just sort, it's already a part of their workflow. Um, I think that in research, this idea of doing plain language translation um, is not necessarily new. There are a lot of man mandates i i don't even know maybe that word's too strong i don't know if it's actual mandate or suggestions from um, the national institutes of health to have at least your summaries in plain language um i don't think there's any requirement that when you apply for nih funding that you specify how you're going to make your content plain language um, they're focusing on how you're going to manage your data but not how um, the patients will interact with the communications that you're trying to put out. I think that 
Yes, it is. And I'll talk a little bit later, but I'll, I'll share now that when you rewrite something for plain language, it can, studies have shown it takes at least five iterations on average to get to the point where you're ready to share that information. So there is a time investment. But remember that once you've you've um, created that document and made it uh, plain language, that's what you're gonna use for the duration of your study. And then maybe you can take that um, information that you learned into your next research study. So, I mean, it would be a great problem, right? If you had 12 concurrent projects going on, that'd be awesome. Um, but for the most part, maybe you've got one, two, three, maybe research projects going. So there is that initial upfront time commitment. Um, so there might be pushback, especially from the person that's been tasked to do it. But I think one of the things to do is to share with your research team why it's so important that you're doing that, because you want people in your study that are fully informed about why they're getting involved in it and what's expected of them. That is really important because you don't want to go through that process and halfway through have half the people drop out and then you don't have enough data. So there could be pushback, but I think if there are initial conversations about the value of what it brings to do that investment of time, um, that I think hopefully that will get everybody on board. And we actually have another question before we move on here. Pamela, Pamela asks, how, how would we be able to find out the potential subject's needs or level of understanding? So this could come um, just with in conversation with them. It might be something that you ask, like, what is your, um, you know, what grade level did you attain without judgment or anything? And, and let me just add that um, somebody who just graduated in uh, 2024, even from high school or college, if they don't seek any further education after that, um, in 2026, they're reading two years behind what they read when they graduated. So we're constantly going backward if we're not staying up to date with our reading skills. Um, so just keep that in mind. If, if you have a bunch of participants that say, well, I, um, I graduated from high school, they're probably not reading at a high school level at this point. They're probably reading at at least two grades lower than that. Um, and I would say in general to make all your content, if possible, uh, written at a sixth grade level so you can reach a wide audience. You're not dumbing down the information. Somebody who reads at a 16th grade level is not going to be offended that they're reading this at a at a sixth grade level. They'll probably be thankful that they can understand what you're asking them to do or that they understand what they're getting involved in. Any other questions, Karen? I think that clarified her follow-up as well. I think we're okay. good to move forward. Great, thank you. And interrupt me at any, any time. Um, so one of the, I just wanted to remind you all, because you're all probably creating um, scripts or writing um, your content in Word, Microsoft Word, and they have a tool to assess the readability in your documents already. So it's already there. Um, and after you run a spelling and grammar check, you can read uh, what the readability score is based on the Flesh Kincaid grade level and the Flesh Reading Ease test. So I put in the abstract from our hyperkalemia article and it gave us a readability score of grade 20 plus. So again, this resource doesn't um, tell us how, what to change, what needs to be changed, it doesn't rewrite it for us. It just gives us a general baseline that this is written um, for somebody with a reading level of grade 20. So I wanted to use chat GPT to show you uh, what it does and how easy it might be able to use. So I put into chat GPT um, the abstract from the hyperkalemia article. And in my prompt, I ask it to make the content a sixth grade reading level. 
However, I ran the response through the Microsoft Word readability function, and what ChatGPT created was actually written at a 10th grade level. And the reason I tell you this is that it's a good example of where human review of the AI content is really crucial. Um, all of these tools provide a good start, but um, refinement is really where it comes in, where, where you get the cultural nuances, that you make sure that um, you know it's not too wordy and that you're getting exactly to the point. So how do models like ChatGPT work? So they're trained on massive amounts of text data. They learn to recognize patterns and generate new text. And um, it's basically the way humans learn to write and communicate. And to improve its responses, resources like ChatGPT use reinforcement learning with human feedback. So there's actually humans um, on the other side of these screens, looking at all the content, um, helping to refine the responses. But again, um, this is just the first pass. So there might be many iterations that, that you want to give to this content to make it usable for your study. So there are a couple of different kinds of um, artificial intelligence. There's some that we're used to using all the time that we not, might not have thought of as AI, and that is traditional AI. And um, if you've used a voice assistant like Siri or Alexa, or you've asked um, Netflix or Amazon to recommend something for you, those are all traditional AI. Uh, but generative AI, on the other hand, like ChatGPT, it's more creative and can uh, create new content um, healthcare is already adopting the use of AI to enhance medical images, um, discover new drugs, simplify tasks with um, patient notes, and create customized patient treatment plans. And here is the uh, report back that I got from Microsoft on the reading uh, level of the chat GPT, even though I asked for a sixth grade, it gave us back a 10th grade. Here's another resource, um, Originality AI. It's a readability checker. Um, so I pasted our abstract in here and you can see where it's highlighted green, um, kind of blue, and kind of a salmon-y pink color. And these all um, are highlighting things that they find problematic in uh, the content, either because it's a long sentence or it's a complicated word. Uh, so it highlights potential issues and it provides scores and stats on the right-hand side of the screen and what can be done to optimize your writing. And um, a lot of readability checkers provide helpful insights, but sometimes you might find it too strict in what it's um, flagging. This resource, for example, flags any words with four syllables. And when dealing with scientific and medical information, that's gonna come up a lot. So you're gonna have to decide if you wanna grapple with every four syllable word um, that comes up in your content. Readable is another resource. Um, it uses, it checks 17 readability formulas, including smog. And Readable can uh, analyze anything from a Word document, a PDF, a web page, or an entire website. So you can even check if you have a website for your um, research project, or maybe you have um, a web page because you're working with community members and you're reporting back, you can run your entire website through Readable and it will check it for um, plain language. So it will help you identify where your content um, needs work by displaying the readability scores on the right-hand side. Um, it checks your spelling and grammar and style issues. And as you edit the text, um, it'll give you a real-time update on how your score has improved. And the Health Literacy Editor is a free tool from the University of Sydney's School of Public Health. 
and it helps you create clear and easy to understand health information. It assesses the reading level. Um, it identifies complex medical terms and suggests simpler alternatives. And it highlights any complex sentence structures and recommends clear phrasing. So um, this is a screenshot, but if you hover over any of um, these terms, it will give you suggestions for substitutions. Um, and then you can change it right at that moment. Another resource is onlineutility.com. They offer a tool to analyze your reading. Um, you another just cut and paste your text and it will calculate um, the readability scores. And um, this is a resource that also uses the smog index. Um, you can learn about improving your writing style and it gives you metrics like your word count, your sentence length, and the average word complexity. Um, this particular tool favors using simpler words and shorter sentences for improved readability. Um, but it will, again, it, it will give you a highlight of all the things that um, things might trip up your reader. Um, so I think it's a, a great resource. And I, I'm sorry, I meant to mention um, that I have a resource guide with all of these resources in them that I will put a link to in the chat box um, when we're done. So uh, you don't need to furiously take notes unless you want to, um, but I have a, a guide put together so you can find all of these resources. Um, another resource, and this one is um, not free, they do have a two day free trial, but in general, it's about a $500 a year um, licensing, but it's the Health Literacy Advisor and it's a user-friendly Microsoft uh, Word add-on that helps you assess and improve the readability of your documents. It was really designed for healthcare professionals um, and it can help you enhance the clarity of any of your written content. Um, I would say that probably most of the hospitals um, that I've worked with use this as a tool to work with all their different units that are creating um, patient content. Um, and I don't know how many of them, I know University Hospital uses this product and um, they do help in the, with anybody at the hospital that needs um, things translated. So I'm sure if you're a clinical researcher there, um, they would be able to use this tool for you. All right, let's look at some resources that'll make your job even easier because they'll actually convert the text for you. So the Hemingway editor is considered a prototype of online editors for writers. It spots errors and suggests how to correct them. And you can see on the screen here, it has a pop-up box um, where you can tell it to simplify a, a long sentence and it will help rewrite that for you. It's very easy to use. Um, so I just copied and pasted the abstract that we had from hyperkalemia and um, it tells tells you what uh, was changed, um, what they made easier to read. So I think it's a really great uh, place to start with your content. And um, so the original content that we put in, uh, let's see, what did it grade it at? I think it graded it at a, let me go back real quick. Okay, so grade 11. Um, oops, sorry, I want to go back one more. Okay, so they had it at a postgraduate level. And then uh, we were able to, through their suggested changes, and I didn't do that many, I just did a quick first pass of change this, firm up that. Um, so I got it down to grade 11. So the program simplified the content by reducing the number of very hard to read sentences from six to three. However, it also increased the number of sentences that are hard to read from zero to seven. So um, it, 
so doing this reminded me of that game of whack-a-mole, you know, where you try to hit one and then three or more pop up. Um, this is sort of like when you do this initially, this is what it feels like. You change one thing and now three other things are being flagged. So just um, be patient. Uh, it won't always be that way. It's just sometimes if you have a really complex uh, set of texts that you're trying to do, it's going to do that initially. So just be patient. And here's an example from HyperWrite AI Plain Language Converter. And the converter leverages um, AI to generate a original, clear, and engaging content. You just simply put in the content that you'd like um, converted, and it will produce text that's easy to understand and free of jargon. And it provides an overview of the changes that it made to your content. And again, depending on your audience, this um, iteration may still be written at a level that is too advanced for your audience. Um, but I think it's a good start. Um, they, they broke up the text into three paragraphs. Um, they, def they made definitions more accessible of you know, more medical terms, making them um, easier to understand. And um, they did some explanations about what some longer uh, medical terms meant. Another AI product that you might have used or um, is easily accessible to you is Google's Gemini product. Um, it's completely free. It's a language model that can be used to create plain language. Uh, so again, you just input your content um, it can generify, uh, generate simplified versions that are easier to understand. Um, and you can tell it, you know, please generate this content at a fifth grade reading level, a fourth grade reading level, a third grade reading level. Um, but again, like we saw, uh, you need to run it through uh, another, another readability pro uh, product just to make sure that it actually did get to the reading level that you're, you're needing. Rewordify is a free online tool uh, designed to make complex text more accessible, and it was developed by a public school teacher. And the tool works by breaking down uh, complex sentences and replacing difficult words with similar alternatives. So you can see where it highlighted certain words, um, and then it gives you some tips on the bottom of like other ways to improve it, or maybe you wanna save your the iterations that you've got, you can do that here. And in addition to the infographic tools that we saw from Claude AI, there's another one called Vengage, and it was developed specifically to create um, visual representations. You can um, put in your text and you can generate an infographic, a poster, a presentation, a flyer, a report, checklist, or a chart. And again, you can go back in. Maybe you feel like what um, Vengage put in here is they didn't capture the important things. I think in general, it does a pretty good job. But again, you need to read it and make sure that it has all the pertinent information that you'd like to share with your study participants. All right, we'll have one last poll. And yes, no, or maybe plain language tools and resources can help reduce the time investment required to create clear and concise research materials. All right. Well, thank you all for participating in that. So I'm glad that nobody said no, but that is a valid answer as well. But um, hopefully for those of you that said maybe some of these tools will help you see um, that it's um, not so onerous to get started in that endeavor. Um, and one last thing that I'd like to share with you 
and it's it's for you to use for your own personal and professional absorption of research that you're reading, um, but could also be used for um, if you're a clinician working with patients um, or in the research realm, looking at how to make your information plain language. And it's called the GOAT AI Summarizer. And this is a Chrome extension that quickly summarizes articles and PDFs and YouTube videos, which I thought was great. Um, so if you put any of your content up on YouTube, you can get a quick summary. And then um, you can uh, share that with your patients or with policymakers, or maybe you're working with another researcher or you wanna collaborate with another researcher. You can make your information um, easily accessible. All right, any other questions that I can answer right now? I don't think so. It doesn't look like we have any uh, questions in the chat. Um, just wanted to take the time to thank you so much for speaking and putting together this amazing presentation. Um, if we were in a real room, I'd prompt everyone to give you a round of applause. <laughs> um, but thank you so much for putting together this presentation. We really appreciate it. Um, as a reminder to everyone, the link to the recording and the presentation slides will be posted um, on our website, and it'll include some of the amazing resources um, that were talked about today. 